Lord, again, we're going to open your word. Please come to us, Lord. Speak very clearly. Bless us. Help us to have a precious closeness. Help us to feel your presence. Give us a growth in grace. Help us to um, make powerful changes here uh, through this weekend. Just come close to us in a beautiful, powerful way. We desperately need you. Help us to hunger and thirst after you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You know, sometimes, it's happened only a few times, God has given me a really special experience in prayer. It's only happened a few times, and sometimes it doesn't even happen in prayer. Sometimes it happens just when I'm thinking, maybe when I'm driving, or just sometimes when I'm just thinking about life and and where we headed and what's happening. A few times I've had an experience where Somehow, God gives me the ability for my mind just to really grasp heaven as a reality. It just feels so real. And there have been times where my soul has just been filled with so much joy. I I almost feel like God has just taken like a little drop of heaven and just put it in my heart. And friends, I can't tell you the thrill that has gone through my heart during these precious little seasons that God has given me. It's like He's given me these little tastes of heaven and I've just never been so happy in my life when I just, it just becomes a reality that one day we're really going to be up there and it's all going to be over. You know, this is a place of loss. This is a place of pain. This, this is not our heaven. This is a place of challenge and difficulty. That's all that this place really offers for us. There's some good times, but generally speaking, this is a rough world. Amen? But God has a better world for us. Where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more depression, no more discouragement, no more anxiety, no more fear, no more trouble, no more worry. It's coming, friends. It's real. And as I've, you know, God's given me these little precious seasons where I've felt this and I just felt like, almost like in my heart, like I went to heaven for a few minutes. I just think to myself, how, what can I do to make that come sooner? How, how, what can we do? What, what, what can happen? And that's what I want to discuss. You know, I shared that whole uh, story about, I gave that Bible study and I shared with that group, you know, since 1844, we were living in the judgment hour and they're like, well, that's kind of been a long time. And uh, it made me start wondering as an early Christian, what, so yeah, why the wait? That is a really long time. What's God waiting for? And if God is waiting for something, what can we do to fix that? Like, I don't want to be longer than we have to. And so, um, we're going to talk about that um, this, this morning. And, you know, I have been um, really surprised because I think for a while, a lot of people in the church had a wrong view of the second coming in terms of what brings it. I remember right after I became a Christian, I was really excited about this message. And I would sometimes I would share in Sabbath school, I'm just that Jesus is coming soon and we're living the last days and I, something happened that really surprised me. Once in a while um, an older brother and sister from you know who had been in the church a long time they'd raise their hand and say well I used to be excited like you but you know I didn't go to college because I thought Jesus was coming. You know I didn't get married because I thought Jesus was coming. You know what I didn't buy that home because I thought Jesus was coming and I didn't do all these things and you know what here I am 75 years old and they shared it in a very bitter. yeah very bitter unhappy way and I remember thinking like is that like where I'm headed like is that like you know I'm I'm all excited now because I'm naive but eventually I'll mature and I'll get like crotchety and you know angry when I'm older is that is that like that were the destination where I'm supposed to get and I was like no that can't be right and um, I think that a lot of people have had, had a misunderstanding of the second coming and what happens, what brings it. I think a lot of people have viewed the second coming like a bus stop. You go to the bus stop, you sit, you wait, and then you wait for the bus to come, right? And if the bus is late, whose fault is it? The person waiting or the driver? It's the driver's fault. What's the matter with this driver? But I, the Bible gives a different picture. The Bible gives a picture of a race. Let us run the race with patience. Now, a race. Can you finish sooner or later? Race? Yeah. yeah. You could take a really long time if you want, or you could go really quickly if you want. 
the second coming is more like a race. The Bible pictures it as a race. Now, what is it that God is waiting for? Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Revelation chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. I think the Bible is pretty clear on this topic. We'll start in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. And we'll read through verse 3. We'll read this and you're going to tell me who we're waiting for. Okay, verse 1. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, the sea, nor any tree. We'll stop right there. For those of you who know this passage, are those winds a good thing or a bad thing? Nothing. Bad thing. Yeah. We're going to see that they hurt the earth. The winds are strife. They're warfare in Bible prophecy. Symbolic language. Verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. What did he have? The seal of the living God. Thank you. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have done what? Sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So let me ask you, according to this passage, who are we waiting for? We're waiting for the servants of God to receive the seal in their foreheads. Those four angels are holding back those four winds, and those are called often the winds of strife. And when those winds let go, that's when we're really going to see catastrophes. That's when things are really going to come unchecked. We think we're in troublous times now. This is what the Bible calls the beginning of sorrows. It will get worse. I hate to inform you. The truth is it will get worse. When those winds blow, it's going to fall apart. But God is waiting. You know, the Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. He's waiting, and he's waiting for who? The, us. us, the servants, to receive the seal of God in their foreheads. This is echoed again. Notice Revelation 19 and verse 6. Turn with me, scoot over to Revelation 19, verse 6. And we're going to read 6 through 8. Revelation 19, verses 6 through 8. Same book, so you're probably there by now. Here we go. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, the Lord our God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Well, why has it come? Notice what it says. For His wife hath made herself ready. So, according to this passage, what brings the marriage supper of the Lamb? For her wife has made her suffer. Who's ever been to a wedding and the bride didn't show up and they're like, you know, let's just move forward anyways. <laughs> let's, let's just do this and you stand up by yourself and, you know, we'll read vows and just pretend there's someone. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. No bride, no wedding, right? Right. Might even be able to do it without a groom, but not without a bride. <laughs> But how has, her, how has the wife made herself ready? Look at verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Amen. So when it says she's made herself ready, according to verse 8, what does that mean she made herself ready? She has the righteousness. She got dressed. She got dressed. She has the righteousness of the of Christ. So let's say there's a wedding. The bride is there, but she doesn't have a wedding dress. Is she walking down the aisle in normal clothes? No, that's not happening. So we need not only a bride, we need a bride and a wedding dress. And when we have that, we, and we got the groom, we can have a wedding. We can move forward. That's all we need. In this case, the wedding has not come. And the marriage supper is essentially that banquet that we're going to have in heaven. The union between Christ, the, the groom, and his church, the bride. What are we looking for? bride needs to put her dress on. She's still in the changing room deciding, uh, do I want that dress? Do I want that dress? And when the bride puts the dress on, the wedding's going to happen. And that wedding essentially is going to be started by the second coming of Jesus. 
And we see that this dress is the righteousness of the saints. Now, some people have said, well, I thought it was Christ's righteousness. It is Christ's righteousness, but he makes it in uniquely your own. His righteousness blends with your character, and he becomes righteous through you, and you change. You become a new creature. And that's what this is referring to. In chapter 20, uh, I'm sorry, chapter uh, 21, it says, Those who do his commandments shall have right to the tree of life. Notice also Ephesians chapter 5. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. This message is all over Scripture. I just want, to, want you to see a few passages. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. Ephesians 5, 27. Okay, well, let's start in verse 25 for some context. It says, Husband, do what to your wives. Love. Love your wives. Notice, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the what? Word. By the word. You see how important the word of God is? We get washed by word, friends. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. This is not a popular message, but friends, this is the message of scripture. Jesus is not coming back for a half-naked bride. He's coming back for a church that has the full wedding garment of Christ on. He's coming back for a holy church. He's coming back for an obedient church. He's coming back for a loving church. A church that hungers for Him. A church that hungers for people. A church that reflects that beautiful, sweet character of Jesus. That's the church He's coming back for. Friends, that can be us. That could be us. And so, why haven't we come back? Why hasn't Christ come back? Because He's merciful. Because he's coming back for a church that's holy. And we are not ready. We're not ready yet. But God is patient. He's giving us this time to prepare us for this event. And I just want to share, um, the majority of this message is going to be me sharing uh, an experience that God led me through. Um, what I think God is, going to, is doing in our lives right now. Um, let me take a drink real quick. Not too long ago, I kind of referred to this in the last message, I encountered uh, some health challenges. And what happened is my digestive health essentially fell apart. And I kind of struggled with it for a while. And what would happen is I would get acid reflux uh, after, after a meal. And kind of like tried different food combinations and maybe it's this one and then I'd think I'd have it figured out and then that would all fall apart and then I'd have to recreate the wheel again. And I just went on for a few years that way until I reached a point where everything I ate caused inflammation in my stomach, even water. I would get acid reflux after drinking water, friends. A salad, acid reflux. Fruit, acid reflux. Beans, acid reflux. No, no matter what I ate, my stomach just rebelled. Rebelled against whatever I was eating. Uh, this was very difficult. I uh, went and I got an endoscopy done and spoke with a gastroenterologist. And she's like, well, you know, um, if this keeps up for a while, you become at risk for something called Barrett's esophagus, which is essentially kind of like pre-esophageal cancer. And uh, they, in the um, endoscopy, they found uh, several masses, and uh, they biopsied them. They're not cancerous, but they're like, yeah, you know, that's not like a good direction. And so I'm thinking, okay, you know, every time I'm getting acid reflux, I'm thinking, am I going to, you know, did I just initiate a cancerous cell in my body? You know, like these thoughts are going through my head. And so um, I, at, at a certain point, I didn't know what to do because everything I ate was generating acid reflux. But I did notice one thing. I could reset my stomach if I would do a short water fast. And then I would, so I would do a short water fast, my stomach would kind of get reset, it would be okay, and then it would start up again. And so guess what I had to do? Another short water fast. And then I reset, be fine, something else would set it off. Guess what I had to do? Another short water fast. Just to make a long story short, I ended up doing, uh, out of a three-month three, three period, I did one month of water fasting. I had to do so much water fasting. What do you think happened to my weight? I got down 
to 104 pounds. I'm almost 5'10". I mean, I was, I looked, so this was winter time at this time, it was winter time. And so, you know, um, and I live in the mountains, so you, you always have a lot of clothes on even inside. And uh, one time in the bathroom, I was just, had just gotten out of the shower or something, and I happened to, you know, not have clothes in my upper body. I looked at myself in the mirror. I, I literally went like that, like, I looked like someone who had just walked out of a concentration camp. You could see every rib. My sternum was very pronounced. Uh, you know, my hips, like, you know, when it goes up, they kind of like curled in. Like, you could see, like, the, almost like the iliac crest there in my hips and the bottom of my ribs. It was, I was like, what? I, I mean, I knew I was doing bad. I didn't realize it was that bad. I, I, and I was terribly fatigued. Um, it got to the point where I, I thought I had to contact my employer because I was losing so much energy, so much strength. I was canceling, you know, speaking engagements. I was canceling Bible studies. And I was like, you know, how much longer can I continue to accept a paycheck from these people and not fulfill my obligations? And I was just close to quitting essentially and it was a it was a severe challenge to my faith it was really a challenge and um, during this time I uh, you know I was praying to God and I was just asking God what is this what are you doing now around the same time I had done uh, previous to this I had done a prophecy seminar and I really wasn't happy with the results of the prophecy seminar there were new people who were coming. I was happy about that, but no solid commitments. And I was just like, you know, that didn't feel like the blessing of God. And I started really praying intensely about this. And I started praying for multiple hours every day. Just, Lord, what's going on? What are you doing? We're living in the last days. I, I mean, you know, I've given my life to this work. Why aren't you just you know, showering this work with your blessings? And I was just crying out to God for hours a day in prayer and just asking Him to give me some understanding on what in the world was going on. And during that time, I randomly got a little book in the mail from a ministry I had donated to once the year before. And it was a book by a Seventh-day Adventist pioneer called W.W. W. Prescott. Has anyone heard of W.W. W. Prescott? He was around during the 1888 era and he really caught on to the righteousness by faith message. Um, incredible man. And he, everywhere he would speak after the 1888 conference, he, tremendous revivals would happen after this guy would speak. And he wrote this little book, um, I believe it was called The, uh, the Promise of the Spirit. And I thought, you know, it's just, it was like 60 pages. I thought, I'll read this book. I was floored. I have not been this impressed by a book probably since the last time, since the first time I read The Great Controversy. I mean, it was like God was speaking to me. After the first chapter, I put the book down and I literally started weeping because I was under so much conviction from the message in this book. And I want to share just a nutshell of what I read. First of all, he went to Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, that's where Jesus says, um, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. At the end of that passage, he talks about how um, if your children asks you for an egg, will you give him a serpent? And if they ask you for a loaf of bread, will you give him a stone? Then at the, the last verse, he says, How much more will not your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I thought to myself, wait a minute. So God is more willing to give the Holy Spirit than parents are to feed their children. That's like re a lot. You know, um, my grandmother was raised during the Great Depression. And she tells this story often. She says, Gabriel, there were times where we all assembled at the table, large families, you know, it's like eight of them. And my mom had to come to the table and say, I'm sorry, children, there's no food for dinner tonight. And every time she tells a story, she tears up. And she says, Gabriel, I cannot imagine coming to my kids. I never had to say that to my boys. I can't imagine coming to my kids and telling them there's no food. I can't imagine doing that. And she, her, her eyes well up with tears. How much do parents want to feed their children? The Bible says God is more willing, more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. So let me ask you, if we are have a deficit of the Spirit. Why? It's not because of God is stingy. It's not because He's holding back. It's because there's something with us. There's something wrong with us. And that's what this book was bringing out. And you know, doesn't that line up with Laodicea? It lines up perfectly with Laodicea. And he went to Hebrews chapter 1. Please turn with me. This will be our last passage that, that we turn to, I believe. Hebrews chapter 1. He, 
Prescott then directed our attention to Hebrews chapter 1, and he brought something out here I had never noticed before. It's so simple, but I tell you, it hit me so hard. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Alrighty. It says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and, even, and, and ever, a scepter of righteousness and the scepter of thy kingdom. So we're talking about the Son of God, right? Notice verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You know, I've read through that passage and... Okay, great passage. Do you realize what that passage is saying? Prescott goes through a series of Bible verses that I'm not going to go through right now. And he brings out, you know what that oil of gladness is? That was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anointed with the huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in another passage, without measure. He just had an unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit. And this says, why? The second part of the verse told us what he got. He got the Holy Spirit. The first half told us why. What did the first half of Hebrews chapter 1 verse, eight, uh, 1 verse 9 say? You have done something. Loved righteousness. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And he brings out the simple point. Why did Jesus get such a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit? He loved righteousness and he hated sin. And you know what God communicated to me? You know why you don't have the Holy Spirit, Gabriel, like Jesus did? It's because you love iniquity and you hate righteousness sometimes. That's the, hard, that's, that's the only conclusion we could derive, friends. We don't hate sin like Jesus did, and we don't love righteousness like Jesus did. Therefore, we don't have the Holy Spirit like Jesus did. And he brought this simple point out, and I was just like... It really bothered me. It really bothered me, because... Uh, I've dedicated, I could be doing a lot of different jobs right now. I've passed up a lot of other better paying jobs to do this. And I've said, Lord, I, why don't I have the Holy Spirit like that? What is it about me? Why can't, why can't you just give me the Holy Spirit like Jesus had? What's going on? And so I started praying about it. I started pleading with the Lord. And around this time is when that acid reflux thing came to a climax. It got really bad. And um, some of the water fast I did for one day, it was 24 hours. Some I did two days, two days of just water. I've done lots of juice fasting. I'm into detoxing. I could do juice fasting quite well. Friends, I hate water fasting. I am not a good water faster. Everyone's biology is a little bit different. It just hits me really hard. I have friends that they can water fast four or five days and continue to go to their construction jobs. Not me. After like, you know, 18 hours, I'm like lightheaded and I just, I, it really hits me hard. I hate water fasting. And the worst part of a two-day water fast is the night, bef the last night. Because you've been not eating for like 40 hours and you're trying to go to bed. And another thing I hate is going to bed hungry. Anyone like going to bed hungry? Not fun. And I remember I was in there in bed one time and it was just, it was like a, a gutter moment. I was just like at an all-time low. And I'm just like holding my stomach. I'm so hungry. And I was just crying. I was like, God, what is this? What are you doing? I've dedicated my life to you and it's like you're destroying me. What is going on? And I've been praying also at the same time. Why don't I have the Holy Spirit? And you know what popped in my head? This interesting conversation I had had with the church member several weeks earlier. What had happened was... I teach a, a, an outreach. It's, it's a plant-based cooking class that we do for the community. And we interact with... The, the most interaction we have with non-Adventists is through that plant-based cooking class. It's been really successful. And um, one of our new members who hasn't been baptized yet, but she's on her way. She's really taken on to the health message and she's all for it. And she was actually um, about to teach her first cooking class. She was going to lead out. And so I was like really excited. And we were talking about it in front of another church member. And uh, this new... The new lady who was going to be leading out, she said, okay, and the recipe should be like a, like a plant-based one, right? I said, yeah, yes, please. And this other church member was sitting there, and this other church member pipes up and says, it doesn't have to be plant-based. I just looked at her like, who are you? What, are you? what are you talking about? She goes, it doesn't have to be. And I was like, uh, yeah, it does. And she goes, why? And I got very, I was like, I got very offended. I thought, 
who are you? What are you doing? But this isn't even your ministry. Like, like, what is this? And I got very firm with her and I said, because we have very clear counsel about that and that's the healthiest way to eat. But my spirit was like, hmm. You know, that, that's, that's how I felt inside. Like, shut your mouth. That's, that's really how I felt. <laughs> Anyhow, so that popped up in my head, you know, while I'm having this, like, this 48-hour water fast. And I was like, yeah, but Lord, she's the one who was budding into my ministry, and she's not even, you know, being faithful to the message, and da-da-da-da-da. And God was like, okay, I'm in the shower. It comes up again. I'm trying to send an email. It comes up again. I'm doing dishes. It comes up again. I'm like, God, you're not, you're not suggesting that I actually call this person. And oh, I could not avoid the conviction. I remember I was actually, I was trying to send an email and it came again. And I was like, okay, okay. Got my phone out. DTT, dialed the phone number. Hi, sister so-and-so. Hi, yeah, this is Gabe. Um, hey, remember that conversation we had a few weeks ago in front of, you know, so-and-so about the cooking class and all that? And she said, yeah. I'm like, you know, um, I got really upset with you. And um, I'm not here to talk about the health message and to, you know, parse straws, you know, all over that. But God's convicting me that my spirit wasn't right. And, um, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did that. I had a wrong spirit. And she said, oh, well, I, I just let that stuff roll off my back. And it really didn't. I was like, oh, well, praise the Lord for that. But, you know, God is telling me that I, I need to do this. And I, I'm sorry. Oh, well, thank you. That, that, that's okay. And, and we had a nice conversation. Two days later, guess who comes up to me? She comes up to me. And she says, I have an apology for you. I was like, oh, you have an apology for me. She goes, you know, I was out of line. And in my head, I was like, yeah, you were out of line. Yeah, I, I agree with you there on that one. She says, it's not even my cooking class, and I, I don't know why I, I did that. And I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? We hugged, and we had a great conversation. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful moment. Rewind back to after I made that phone call that day. I put down the phone. I was like, ah, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, time to send that email. I go to send an email. Another instance pops up in my head. I was like, that person too. I was like, wow, you gotta be kidding me. I was like, well, I've already done it once, you know. And so, another situation, someone I had a tense conversation with, I called them up. Hi, sister so and so. Hey, you know, um, I think God's doing a work of revival in my life. And um, do you remember such and such? And you know what, I, I really felt like I lost my patience with you in that conversation, and I'm really sorry. Would you please forgive me? Every time, just about every time I, I did this, people were like, oh, of course, and no, I, I, I understand, and you're under a lot of pressure, and it's like, well, thank you, but you know, I, I need to make things right, and just, it wasn't, it wasn't like Christ-like. It wasn't Christ-like. My spirit was not Christ-like, and I'm sorry. Hung up the phone. <sighs> okay, feels good to do the will of God. Now it's time to send that email. Another one popped in my head. Friends, this went on all day long. Mm -hmm. By the end of the day, I had contacted eight people. It actually extended to two days. And by the end of the second day, I had contacted 10 people. And each preceding one got more challenging. And it went from church members who I'd had uncomfortable conversations with to people in my past who had done things who, that really hurt me and that really had done me wrong and that I was really not happy about. It even got down to certain family members and people who had uh, been married into my family who, who did things that still to this day I think were not right, were not right at all. But I know that my spirit wasn't right either. And that God showed me that for several of these people, I can genuinely say I hated them. I hated them. There was one particular family member. I knew, I knew I had issues. I just didn't know what to do. I could not even be in the same room with this person because of the things that they had done and they were doing. I could not even be in the same room with this person. And I just, you can't clean yourself. You can't clean the vessel. You are the dirty thing. And you can't clean a dirty thing with a dirty thing. But what you can do is ask God to come in. 
and do for you what you could never do for yourself. I could not make myself stop hating those people. I had to ask God to come in and put forgiveness in my heart, and He did just that. I have no, it's incredible. All these people I look at, I had all these issues with, I have nothing with them now, friends. It's just, it's a clean slate. It's a clean slate. It's incredible. God is that powerful. He can do this. But we have to ask. We have to ask. My appeal to you this evening is, are you willing to start asking God, Lord, why don't I have the Holy Spirit with great power? Lord, would you please start taking me through the process? Lord, would you please show me why I don't have your Holy Spirit? And my appeal is, are you willing not only to say that prayer, but to say it until you get an answer? If you're willing to say that prayer, if this is something that you'd like to start doing in your prayer life, start including this in your prayer life, would you just raise your hand right now and say, you know what, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to start praying that way and to ask the Lord why I don't have the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Good. Let's close. Let's ask the Lord right now to start this process in us. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Father in Heaven, Lord, thank You for... Um, allowing me to survive that harrowing experience and giving me an experience and a testimony to share with my brothers and sisters here. Lord, you're preparing a people. You're preparing a holy people. You're not coming back for a half-naked bride. You're coming back for a beautiful, holy bride. But Lord, we can never make ourselves righteous. You must come into our hearts. But in order for you to come into our hearts, we have to remove those roadblocks. We have to remove the sin from our lives. We have to cooperate with you in shunning evil and putting away those things that put division between us and you, that put division between us and each other. Lord, you've seen the hands here. I pray, Father, would you please do a work in every single person who indicated they wanted to start going through this process. Show each and every one here in their individual heart what it is, what is blocking the Holy Spirit from filling them to the brim like Jesus had the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Show us, Lord. Help us to see what it is. And Lord, give us the Holy Spirit not to glorify ourselves, but that we could glorify You. That we could share with this lost and dying world that there is a Savior. There is a new kingdom coming. There is a new reality coming. A heaven on earth. Lord, it's coming and we want to be part of it. And I ask and pray that you be with each and every one of us, that we will be honored to be your, your vessels and your bride and your church in these last days to declare this truth, this gospel of victory to the entire world. We ask it and we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.